I'm very happy and honored to be here in the seventh conference as uh, in uh, Harry's, Harry Potter's books, uh, he who must not be named says, isn't seven the most uh, magical, most important magical number? And I think uh, hopefully this discussion becoming first uh, public discussion of those issues will produce magical results. Now, uh, I uh, looked at the list of people around the table when I was preparing the slides and I realized that we've already discussed these issues together in July in Dubrovnik and in the IMF conference on institutional quality, governance and convergence. So I will try to steer away from my presentation in July to something new we've done since then. And I think um, what P Peter has said is very important, issues related to governance, fairness, issues related to rise of populism, issues related to democratic political institutions, reversals of reforms and so on. I will talk a little bit about, uh, about that but I'm mostly going to talk about the background of uh, convergence and lack of convergence. Now, uh, I will show you what we have on this particular region, but I will also talk about EBRD region as a whole, which now includes not only post-communist countries, but also Turkey, also includes uh, Middle East and North Africa. And um, in that sense, when I say EBRD region, I should say that uh, that also means not only post-communist countries and not only Central European, Southern European countries. We also operate in Greece and Cyprus on a temporary basis, just for you to know. So our region now includes some previously uh, uh, non-members, let's, let's put it this way. Anyway, so this is, this is the uh, chart which uh, is completely consistent with what Peter was talking about. So our region used to grow fast and now it's not growing fast. So 2008 was a major structural break when growth rates slowed down. This is not something which happened in other emerging markets. And so people started to talk about middle income trap regarding our countries of operation. So our countries reach middle income and now they need to come up with a new model to make convergence sustainable. Now, it is actually not true that our countries are in a typical middle income trap. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So why is that? So let us compare our countries to other middle income countries. So what we did for each country of operation of ours, we created a synthetic control panel. So comparator based on several countries, at least 15 countries with similar income levels, similar levels of development and also similar populations, weight by population. So this is the chart where you see how our countries performed relative to comparators before the crisis and after the crisis. And before the crisis, you see green bars, which show that our region outperformed the comparators. And after, after uh, the crisis, you see red bars. I think these are reasonably red on this chart, uh, which show that our region underperformed the comparators. So it's not just our countries are in a typical middle income trap. Now, compared to other middle income trapped countries, our countries are doing even worse. And we are talking about cumulative 9% of output underperformance after the crisis. Now, we can go country by country, but for the sake of time, I will not do it. If you have questions, we can go back to this chart and, and talk about specific countries. But uh, let me uh, talk about decomposition of the slowdown. So let's look at the decade before the crisis. What did our region do in terms of solo growth decomposition, so solo growth accounting? Basically, our region converged to the West. Our region grew fast because of growth in TFP, which is kind of expected. Our countries used to be in the, uh, industrialized, urbanized, educated. So further increase in contributions of labor, human capital, and capital was less important then putting those factors of productions together in a more efficient way than they used to be under the old system. And that's why if you look at the first bar and look at the comparator bar, which is what I just said, this is the bar based on group of comparators for each country of operations, you see that our countries did better than comparators and most of this outperformance was driven by contribution of TFP growth. Now let's move to the next slide, which unfortunately is much less optimistic or much less positive, I should say. I, I always stay optimistic about our region. And um, uh, the future is always brighter than the present. Uh, so the 
uh, this, this graph, which I think is the main takeaway from what uh, I would like uh, you to see in this presentation, is that in our region, after the crisis, TFP growth has become negative. Most of the growth, whatever slow it was, is now driven by capital accumulation, and capital accumulation also underperformed. But overall, if we look at comparator regions, comparator countries with similar income levels had positive, well, zero, zero TFP growth and larger capital accumulation. Also larger contribution of labor. Our countries are also doing not as well in demographics and uh, similar contribution of human capital. Now, if you look at Africa, Latin America, emerging Asia, you have all kinds of stories, but everywhere you see that uh, other countries, other emerging markets overperform our region. Now, let us go region by region. We also group countries. And I guess the reason for that, I guess the same as in, in, in ECB and, and the Commission, is that we need to have teams that cover several countries. So in our case, we have Central Europe and Baltics, and we have Southern Europe, uh, which cover SCE, SEE. -E. Um, and uh, if you look at the last two uh, pairs of bars, you see Central Europe and countries which are comparators to Central Europe, and you see Southern Eastern Europe and comparators to Southern Eastern Europe. And you also see that both of those regions radically underperformed the comparators, and you also see that a contribution of TFP growth has been negative in both, and uh, you see that uh, in uh, Central Europe, not surprisingly, <coughs> and in Southern Eastern Europe, we have major demographic challenges. Now, so this is a point of concern, and of course, that is uh, completely consistent with the focus on the, of this conference on institutions, thinking about what we can do to make uh, TFP growth to be restarting. Now, this is not the middle income trap, of course, as I said, is worse in our countries, but it's not something which is globally unknown. So if you look at TFP growth as a percentage, uh, a, 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 as a function of percentage of U.S. level of GDP per capita, you see that there is a middle income problem. So er, around middle income, you see that uh, the nonlinear trend of TFP growth with regard to level of development is around zero or even negative. And our countries are kind of approaching, uh, approaching this trap, this level of 40, 50 percent of U.S. level, and that's where TFP growth is, is uh, a challenge. Now, South Korea is one successful counterexample to that. South Korea managed to move from growth model based on investment, adoption of technologies developed somewhere else, to the model of post-industrial development based on human capital, innovation, and research. But otherwise, middle-income countries are uh, facing trouble. And this trouble is usually exactly what Korea managed to avoid. So countries build institutions which are suitable for industrial development model, but not suitable for innovation-based model. And reforming the institutions is exactly the challenge. Now, in our countries, the story is actually a bit more complicated because they also had the source of growth coming from reforming the uh, inefficiencies inherited from Soviet Union. That was a gap of productivity catch-up that could be covered, and it was covered, and now we have additional challenges. Now, let me add something, and I'm not going to talk about pollution today, but let me add something about environmental Kuznets curve. Uh, this is not a very robust relationship, and yet, conceptually, middle-income trap is also about pollution. Because if you have rich countries that moved on to post-industrial, service-based, innovation-based growth model, their pollution is low. If you look at the poor countries that have not yet industrialized, pollution is also low. These are the middle-income countries that have polluting industries and are yet to uh, transition to a new sustainable mo growth model. So let me skip country by country uh, graph, but also say that if you evaluate the accumulated gap in investment over the last few years, we see that we are talking about two trillion euros, which our region has not uh, invested relative to comparators, out of which about 40% is due to infrastructure investment. So this is something uh, very important for us because we are actually a bank. Uh, we are not a central bank. We invest in energy infrastructure and other projects. Now, let me, uh, let me talk a little bit about some work we are doing for the forthcoming transition report. So what we try to do, we try to look at 
uh, the transition from overperformance to soft landing or hard landing after long overperformance episode. So what we, what we did, we looked at uh, countries which managed outperforming the comparators for a long period of time. And then we asked the question, how these episodes end? And basically the answer is, well, in 40% of the cases, they end with a hard landing, with something that we observe in our countries now. But in many cases, firms manage to uh, do soft landing, and some episodes are still continuing. And uh, in that sense, uh, it is a question, let me skip this slide now, uh, it is a question of what drives uh, the ability to avoid hard landing of an overperformance episode. And uh, of course, one of the things was uh, uh, something that Peter discussed related to capital flows, to current accounts. So countries which base their growth models on uh, external inflows would have a problem, especially after a crisis with a sudden stop. And so on the left, this is a story of uh, uh, beginning of an outperformance episode. And you see that it's about uh, growing investment, but also growing current account. And uh, the, uh, the right-hand chart is about the end of uh, each outperformance episode, where you see that uh, countries uh, have a shrinking uh, current account and uh, 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 slowdown in investment. Now, we ran a simple uh, panel regression looking at those episodes, and we find, not surprisingly, there is no rocket science here, that investment matters, institutions matter, demographics matter, financial development openness, and savings or current account also matter. And these bars show the regression coefficient, so we find that investment is more important than institutions, but institutions come second. Um, so let me say a few words about governance, politics, and institutions. This is something that uh, we observe for a few years, and we keep talking about this, but I think this is worth repeating. So a lot of people talk about how lack of democracy is good for reforms, that you need to centralize political institutions to reform. This is not what we observe in our region. In our region, there is a clear correlation between countries that continue to be open, democratic, and therefore being able to sustain reforms, and there are countries which manage to reverse democratic transition and build crony capitalist systems. And this is something, I, I'm just showing you one chart, but we actually have the whole transition report three years ago devoted to this, and we continue running those regressions, and we see that in our regions at least, but also actually globally there is an emerging consensus that uh, democracy is not negatively correlated with growth. And in our case, we also see quality of economic institutions and quality of political institutions are closely correlated. And it's not just across countries, it's also within countries over time. We see that countries that uh, move, move backwards are in the left-hand side uh, lower quadrant. These are the countries, uh, the, this is the countries that are not uh, managing to reform their political institutions. Now, you can always find counterexamples. But, uh, and I'm happy to talk about specific countries, but in general, I should say that we are talking about, in our countries, the great divide between countries which manage to build democratic institutions and competitive economies, and countries which centralized political institutions and built crony capitalism. Now, this is a regression which confirms that. We, we run it globally, and we also add uh, transition country dummy interaction with quality of political institutions, and basically, Democracy is good for quality of economic institutions. We me measure those in this regression as average of four world governance indicators, rule of law, control of corruption, uh, quality of regulation, and uh, government effectiveness. And quality of political institutions we measure by polity two score of polity four data set. And you see that there is a positive co regression coefficient, and this coefficient, if anything, is higher in transition countries, even though this uh, transition country dummies interaction with quality of political institutions is not significantly different from global correlation. Um, now, one of the things that we also can say, once, one, one, once uh, we run those regressions and try to uh, look at uh, magnitudes of those coefficients and decompose quality of uh, institutional convergence, we see that EU membership matters. EU membership in our region is, uh, is the single most important factor. And uh, again, within your, uh, uh, your uh, 
group of countries, everybody has accomplished uh, uh, convergence in terms of uh, acute humanitarian or almost accomplished, uh, even though there are some, some backtrack. But since we look at both members and non-members, we can actually judge, and this is the graph that I would like to show. So this is average annual change in quality of institutions relative to the accession year. And you see that three years before accession, you have major acceleration in reforms, and right after accession, it goes down, and on average, basically, reforms slow down on average to zero. So uh, EU accession is important both across countries, within countries. So uh, one of the things which people talk about a lot, they talk about inequality. And I'm happy to take questions about inequality. Last year's transition report was all about inequality and inequality of opportunity. We also now have a paper about European trust crisis and rise of populism in Europe, uh, which just uh, came out in Brookings' papers on economic activities. And basically, there we show how uh, and why people vote for po populist anti-European parties in European subnational regions. But I would also say that it's not only inequality of opportunity, it's fair versus unfair inequality. So basically, we decompose inequality into inequality of opportunity, which we call unfair inequality, and the rest, which you may attribute to effort. And the rest we would call fair inequality. And fair inequality in our region is not an empty word. Why? Because 30 years ago, we all lived in countries, well, we lived in countries, where people working harder would be paid the same amount. And this is unfair equality. So transition was about replacing unfair equality with fair inequality. Unfortunately, in many of our countries, we have unfair inequality, inequality of opportunity. And we see that actually people ha are happy with fair income inequality. You see that there is a positive and significant coefficient there in uh, the impact of fair income inequality for support of market reforms. And, uh, it's actually negative for unfair inequality. So not all inequality is bad, but inequality of opportunity, this is where your outcomes are driven by circumstances you cannot control, such as place of birth, parental background, ethnicity, gender, race, and so on. This is what peer belie uh, people believe being unfair and rejecting reforms in this case. Now let me say just a few words about, uh, about uh, firm level productivity. And uh, I, I'm conscious of time, but I'll try to be reasonably quick. So one of the things which uh, we do, we we'll run big surveys of firms, and I'm very happy to say that we used to do it with the World Bank, now we will also do it jointly with the European Investment Bank next year. And in those surveys, we look at governance of firms, we look at their perceptions and practices of corruption, we look at quality of innovative and uh, R&D efforts in those firms. And basically, the story of our firms is a story of innovation light growth. So our data show that if you look at uh, firm level or country level intensity of innovation, South Korea grows income per capita and number of patents. China increases income per capita and number of patents. Pretty much the slope in China and Korea is actually the same. Israel, similar slope. Our countries in this chart are very flat in the sense that we adopt somebody else's innovation, we grow. TFP grows because we rearrange factors of production in, in more efficient way, which is great, but we are not yet inventing new uh, products, new services. Now, one other thing which I would like to mention, and this is, I'm very happy to talk about this here because this is based on Comp CompNet, a data set initiated by ECB. We are now also members of CompNet, and I'm very happy uh, about this data set because it allows to compare many uh, different countries in a very rigorous way. So, one of the things we find is in our region, we have many small firms. Now, I'm not against small business, but I'm in favor of growing and efficient small business. This is not we what we observe in our countries relative to Western countries. So this is a chart, again, one of the main takeaways I, I want you to focus on. If you take 100 being the level of the smallest firm's TFP in this economy. So the question is, in our countries of operation, what is the size premium in terms of TFP? How, much more pro how more productive are larger firms compared to smaller firms? And the answer is, in our case, it's something like 
the factor of two, larger firms controlling for sector, for location, uh, for other things. Larger firms are twice as productive as small firms. In Western Europe, the premium is 50%. So we are talking about a major productivity challenge because small firms don't grow. And we also look uh, at entry and exit, and we see that small firms also don't exit. So they s stay the same, they neither grow nor exit relative to the Western Europe. So again, let me say a few things about firm level convergence challenges. Again, we know that the closer you are to the frontier, the harder it is for you to grow. And we observe that, so up to the level of something like 60, 70% of German TFP level firms uh, slow down in TFP growth. So if you're further away from German uh, level, it's easier for you to adopt better technology, including better managerial technology and grow productivity. So the trend is negative. And this is kind of TFP convergence, which is going on up to 60, 70% of German level. And uh, red, do, uh, red diamonds here are, are our countries and blue ones are, are Western countries. But now the question is where the slowdown ends at 70% and where it continues up to uh, 100%. And basically when we run interactions and try to explain what are the differential factors that affect the ability to continue to converge, not to slow down TFP growth when you get to 50 or 60 or 70 percent, the answer is uh, you have to be more open. So industries which import more and export more continue TFP growth and convergence up to 100 percent of uh, US uh, TFP levels. When we look at integration in global value chains, in our case, it's also the case firms that are parts of uh, global value chains, they are less likely to slow down once uh, they approach uh, uh, advanced countries levels. And finally, one other thing I would like to mention is job creation. We all care about job creation also because this is an uh, Im important issue for political economy. And basically, in the global set setting, in the advanced economy settings, especially in Anglo-Saxon countries, in US in particular, people talk about job polarization that jobs are created at the top of income distribution, at the top of skill pyramid, and at the bottom, in the middle, they are being wiped out. And technological progress actually creates job light growth. So if you look at a company like Facebook, it's not a home to many jobs. Now, in our country, the story is actually different. More efficient firms are creating jobs. And this is the chart which shows the job growth at firms and industries which are closer to productivity frontier, these industries are more likely to create jobs at 2% a year, while uh, firms that are further away from productivity frontier are those non-dynamic smaller firms that actually don't create jobs. And uh, in the case of 20 or 30% of uh, Germany TFP level, these firms actually create jobs at a rate which is not significantly different from zero. So let me conclude now. Uh, and say some less controversial things, which I mentioned uh, in, my, uh, in my talk, because this is what uh, media sometimes uh, uh, tends to take away. But basically, uh, our countries are slowing down. This is a fact. And this slowdown is actually worse than in comparable middle-income economies. And this is something that is uh, driven by the need to reinvent the growth model. The old growth model has exhausted itself, so we need to think about growth model based on human capital, innovation, firm dynamics, entry and exit. And uh, for that, of course, we need better institutions that protect competition, protect firm dynamics, provide incentives to integrate with the global economy, innovate, and so on. Now, one other uh, important takeaway I would like to mention is the one I just showed in the previous slide. In our countries, in our middle-income countries, productivity growth is not about losing jobs. It's actually about creating jobs. And I think this is why, in our case, we don't have this trade-off between rising TFP and, losing, uh, and, uh, and employment. In our case, these things go hand-in-hand. Hand hand. When we grow smaller firms, make them mid-size and large, we actually create jobs, not lose jobs. So this is where I'm going to end, and uh, I would encourage all of you to read the forthcoming transition report, which we will unveil in November. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Sergio. I had a look on the transition report to prepare this, this meeting. So we are, full, we are really on time, uh, thanks to <laughs> the fact that I put it very short, my, my introductory remarks. My, my summary of, of what you said um, is about the same. But uh, from imitation to innovation, I think that's, that's qu quite interesting uh, uh, to reflect on this. The infrastructure deficit that you mentioned, but you also put there the intellectual property def deficit, which came very often also in your, in your presentation. The reliance on foreign savings was also, uh, I think, quite, quite interesting in, in, in the presentation. Then, of course, the more controversial and political question about democracy uh, and the quality of economic institutions, I think, which is... Uh, uh, a complex theme, of course, because uh, democratic, you know, there are very different forms of democracies also. So it's not a concept which is so easy, but you, I think you, you came with a sort of convincing, convincing uh, graphs there. So that may also come in the discussion. It's a bit more, more difficult. Um, you had the uh, European Union membership does matter uh, positively, which uh, I think uh, we fully agree with that. The, but, but then you came with the, it, it works better in the pre-accession pre, uh, uh, period than in the post-accession. What I found was interesting also that graphs. And then fairness, and I know Marie is going to come also with question of trust and fairness and the importance of these uh, soft sort of, uh, of values, difficult to measure values, but quite, quite important. And then you, you came about the uh, equality of opportunity, of course, which is uh, uh, very important. The CompNet, I was quite happy that you mentioned that because quite, quite uh, important efforts to get these statistics. And I, I looked at, uh, indeed, other studies where you had the diffusion of ITC uh, and the structure of firms. The micro firms would probably not be very good in diffusing technology and making the, the investment. And more, more important, which you mentioned, actually, is the turnover of the micro firms, which is say they tend to persist, sometimes on the fringe you know, of the official market also. Uh, that's one of the way of surviving in sort of gray or parallel economy. Uh, but obviously, they're not very good in general in the diffusion of the ITC or other technologies in general, which I think was also a very important you mentioned. So, so now we are fully oh, in time, but now we are on our budget. Marie, uh, you have the floor now. Yes, when I get my... You get... Um, you can present mine as well. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> They're not the same. <laughs> They're complement. They're com they complement. And so, then you push here on the, yeah. on the right. Huh? Okay. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for the invitation. Happy to be here and share the OECD's view on the catching up process in CC countries. And actually, I could use also your slides. I was happy to hear that uh, uh, our messages are not uh, in conflict uh, against each other. Uh, so there we will be. Uh, some overlapping, uh, of course, in their in the messages. Uh, but OECD's engagement uh, with the region uh, is deep. Uh, from uh, the uh, these countries, uh, seven uh, are uh, OECD members from Central and Eastern European countries. Latvia was the latest to join last year, and we are just now discussing with Lithuania. So it's only a question of time when Lithuania will join. And uh, during the uh, autumn, we will discuss inside the OECD about uh, uh, some uh, new members. Uh, so uh, maybe the membership of, of the CC countries will increase in the uh, future when it comes to the OECD uh, membership. And we have several programs uh, uh, at the OECD uh, in which we uh, cooperate uh, with the countries in this region. We have a regional program on Southeast Europe that promotes stability and prosperity in the region since 2000. And we have also work in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the Caucasus and Central Asia. And then I uh, would uh, like to underline the work or the joint OECD EU uh, SIGMA initiative, which supports institution building and structural uh, reforms uh, in the um, public uh, sector. So I will show now some facts and figures on uh, convergence in Central Eastern, Eastern and Southeastern Europe. But I think that uh, the most important part of my me message will be the OECD's reform priorities uh, to revive uh, convergence. But to begin with, let me say I totally agree with Peter Pratt that it's a bit difficult uh, to discuss uh, this uh, group of countries because uh, uh, it's a very diverse uh, group. But despite this diverse, diversity, of course, they share a common convergence uh, challenge. And after a period of rapid catch-up over the past two decades, 
Since the global financial crisis, these countries have seen a slowdown in convergence, uh, as we heard uh, from Sergei, uh, and really compared with more advanced uh, European uh, countries. And going a bit more into the details, uh, I know that it is a bit violent to put these countries into groupings, but I'm trying to do it. Uh, I put them in two, uh, four different groups. Uh, first, Southeast European economies, the former Soviet Union states, the Baltics, and the Central uh, Eastern countries in order to go through a little bit of the progress uh, they have made and to see where they stand now. So first, the, to the Southeast European uh, economies. So the breakup uh, of Yugoslavia and the prolonged conflict that accompanied it provided very little supportive conditions for convergence. And this decade was followed by a credit-driven consumption boom that abruptly ended with the global financial crisis. And when it hit Southeast Europe, it revealed the shortcomings of this credit-based growth model, which relied on consumption rather than productive investment and exports. See, economies had limited resources to mitigate the impact of the crisis, and as a result, its effects are still being felt across the region today. Government finances were strained, and the low debt ratings reduced the scope for fiscal stimulus. And top of this, the euroization of these economies limited the scope for competitive devaluation. So these economies have also not fully recovered from the impact of the crisis, and on top of that, many of these countries have faced political challenges in recent years. A major shift is needed to help the region achieve a new growth model based on innovation and skills. The second group, uh, the former Soviet Union states, Russia, the region's largest economy, grew fast and converged rapidly towards European Union averages until around 2013 fueled by strong commodity prices. But since then, convergence has stalled and GDP per capita remains 60% below the EU average. And the reasons for this disconnect uh, with the EU are both economic and political, as you very well know. Russia still heavily depends on oil exports, and so recent sharp decline in oil prices meant a blow to oil revenues, leading to declining investment and household consumption. And the sanctions in the wake of the Ukraine crisis also hit non-oil exports and imports were replaced by home-produced goods, which are less productive. So the other countries in that region have equally shown disappointing convergence. GDP per capita in Belarus, Moldova, and Ukraine remains below 50% of the EU average. And these economies were also badly affected by the global financial uh, crisis. So the third group, uh, the Baltic states, uh, in the Baltic states, the convergence performance has been uh, remarkable, especially uh, compared to uh, some other countries. While in 1995, average per capita income stood at only around 28% of the EU 15 average. In 2015, so in 20 years' time, it has reached 66.5%. Uh, so EU membership, membership has been an important engine to convergence. And the harmonization of regulations before their accession to the EU in 2004, so the adoption of the Aki Communitaire, helped these countries to significantly improve their institutional quality. EU structural funds have also played an important role in fostering structural reforms by improving the business environment and financing uh, important structural uh, policies. So their admission to the euro area has thus helped to strengthen their financial and fiscal frameworks. And these achievements are remarkable, especially because the politics were very vulnerable at the start of the global uh, financial uh, crisis. So turning to the last, uh, the fourth uh, group, let me look at the Central and Eastern European uh, countries. These countries achieved significant convergence vis-a-vis -vis other EU countries before the crisis, but however, the progress has been uneven across countries and the path not always smooth. Countries which entered the EU with lower income levels have converged somewhat faster, but on the other hand, the catch-up has been limited for richer countries like Slovenia, Czech Republic and Hungary. 
extensive EU structural funds and large uh, inward uh, FDI in some countries, and particularly in export-oriented sectors, such as automotive, uh, like in Czech Republic and Hungary, have secured a high integration into global value chains and have importantly contributed to drive uh, growth. Moreover, where there was convergence, it was not always sustainable. The rapid convergence before the crisis reflected an investment boom supported by a positive global environment, including strong capital inflows and optimistic expectations about the growth prospects of these countries in an enlarged EU. So due to rapid and in some cases overly unbalanced growth, most countries accumulated considerable internal and external imbalances prior to the crisis, reflected in high inflation and wide current account deficits. And these vulnerabilities meant that these economies were significantly hit by the crisis, with all countries, except Poland, experiencing negative uh, growth rates in 2009. And while most countries recovered rapidly, growth rates have remained significantly lower in the post-crisis period, and uh, convergence has slowed down largely as a result of uh, lower potential uh, growth. And when we, oh, so these slides, sorry, I didn't, that was a slide I was yeah, supposed to uh, uh, show in the first place. Now we come, uh, here you see the convergence uh, process. These, these were not in the right order, uh, the slides. So that's, that was concerning convergence, but now to the potential uh, growth. Uh, and when we have a look at the, the whole uh, region uh, again, so the, Convergence prospects for the region seem very uh, bleak uh, following the global financial crisis and weak productivity growth and low investment rates during the crisis, which have come on top of a rapidly aging population and also declining workforce, have reduced the long-term growth potential of these economies, as you see here. And in addition, many higher skilled workers have left the region in search of better opportunities abroad. So the international context, while becoming, as we all uh, can see, more supportive, it may not provide the same support as during the previous decades. Uh, in our recent uh, interim economic outlook, uh, the global uh, economy uh, is picking up uh, with global GDP growth projected to increase to around 3.5 uh, this year, next year 3.7 uh, from 3% 3 in 2016. But however, strong and sustained medium-term global growth is not yet secure. So the, the recovery of business investment and trade remains weaker than needed to sustain healthy productivity growth. And in the euro, euro area, a major trading partner for the region, potential growth has substantially fallen as a result of weak productivity and investment. So the prospect for uh, further EU enlargement are uh, uncertain, and given these challenges, the slowdown in the pace of structural reform documented in our 2017 Going for Growth uh, report uh, is deeply uh, concerning. Uh, this annual flagship uh, pro, uh, publication shows that the pace of reforms has steadily declined in 2011 to 12 in the EU, including uh, in Central Europe, as you can see uh, here. And it also shows that the implementation of the type of reform packages uh, we typically recommend to force the convergence has been uneven. In many European countries, reforms have been undertaken in either labor or product markets, but not so often in both areas. Uh, this means that governments have missed opportunities to take advantage of synergies in reforms and by doing that, they, of course, increase the risk of uh, getting fewer benefits uh, of fewer uh, people. So our message uh, really is uh, that these reform packages are uh, uh, the most uh, influential ones. Uh, so reforms both uh, in labor and product markets implemented at the same time uh, to achieve the best uh, results. CC countries have only one way to restart the convergence machine, 
and that is to accelerate and intensify their reform efforts. And these countries need to keep pressing for reforms in crucial areas such as education, skills, labor, competition, anti-corruption, to name uh, just a few. And going a bit more into the details, uh, from the OECD's perspective, I want to name, when it comes to uh, these reform priorities, uh, I want to name two areas. Uh, first, boosting productivity, and second, improving the quality of institutions. So when it comes to uh, productivity, which is key to fostering convergence and offset also the impact of demographic pressures on long-term growth and on public budgets, more productive societies not only grow faster and create more jobs, but also enjoy better living standards. And at the OECD, we have spent a lot of time thinking about what can be done to get back to faster productivity uh, growth, uh, as well as uh, reverse the slowdown in productivity experienced by most uh, countries. And when we look at what has been happening with productivity over the past two decades, we see a number of factors at play which look like they could be reversed by policies. So our recent work points to three uh, such uh, factors. First uh, is what appears uh, to be a widening dispersion of productivity across firms, in particular between leading firms and the others. And this suggests that there has been at least a partial breakdown of the diffusion of innovation from leaders to laggards. Another is the decline in the pace of business creation in most countries, the share of young firms in total businesses has been falling. And the third important trend to note is the slowdown in the growth of investment in knowledge-based capital, such as research and development, skills, and organizational know-how. So boosting productivity will be really essential to help the region move up the value chain and connect with regional and global markets. And the recipe for reforms varies from country to country, but there is a common set of structural economic challenges that will need to be tackled, including low levels of innovation, skills gaps exacerbated in a number of economies by significant emigration of skilled workers, fragmented capital markets, and limited access uh, to finance. And reform should also focus on enhancing human capital, as well as improving the business environment to allow the benefit of significant foreign direct investment in the region to spread to the rest of the economy. But what is clear is that even if we manage to foster convergence, we would not really be prospering unless the fruits of growth are widely uh, shared. So we need to work on both, on both boosting growth and making uh, it uh, inclusive in that sense, very much the same, same uh, uh, message as uh, Sergei Gurjev uh, took, uh, took up. We can partly <clears throat> uh, also reverse uh, the effect of population aging on growth by extending working lives and getting more people, particularly women, in the workforce. For example, increasing female labor force participation could help support growth in southeastern Europe and Turkey. But, but last, uh, not, not, certainly uh, not uh, least, uh, it's uh, critical to improve the quality of uh, institutions if we really want to reinvigorate growth uh, and the convergence uh, process. One could identify plenty of idiosyncratic features that hinder these economies, but really the quality of institutions is in many cases an impediment to more and better investment, as well as to productivity growth in the region. So property rights are not enforced in many countries. Governance of state-owned enterprises is opaque. Public governance is weak. Corruption is a barrier for investors. And uh, lower development uh, and higher corruption really go together, as you can see uh, in this uh, slide. So ambitious and forward-looking strategies are needed to strengthen institutions 
and countries should address their needs for a strong professional civil service with managers who are appointed on merit and who are able to work across institutional boundaries to deliver value for money within budget for large-scale projects, as well as delivering services efficiently and effectively to business and citizens. Efforts should also focus on building stronger and better enforced property rights, improve governance of state-owned enterprises and fighting corruption. And the governance of state-owned enterprises uh, has been really the weak point of all those uh, uh, CC countries or, uh, which have joined the OECD uh, most recently, uh, despite of the fact that they have been also members of the European Union. So every single country has been obliged to make uh, changes in their legislation when it comes to the state-owned uh, uh, enterprises in order to join the uh, OECD. That's, that was the case uh, with, uh, with the latest we joined uh, with Estonia and uh, uh, Latvia, but also the case with uh, Lithuania. But having mentioned uh, all uh, these uh, needs uh, to reform uh, also the institutions, uh, uh, I want to uh, underline that uh, the quality of institutions uh, depends not on form only, but also on the way their essence is brought to life. So formally, what is needed is, of course, checks and balances, oversight frameworks and institutional settings, and they are mostly in place but really what is uh, needed and what is lacking uh, is the genuine belief in their functioning. The Balkan Parameter Public Opinion Survey 2017, which will be officially launched next Monday in Brussels, shows a concerning absence of confidence in institutions. So this mistrust risks eroding these frameworks, enabling political capture and further weakening or in the worst case, abolishment of their roles and powers. So this versus circle is endangering the overall economic growth prospects. And to get the best managers to lead public institutions is, uh, uh, of course, important. But in, in order to make sure that we get the best managers, we need also to give them the necessary freedom to work. And a, Good example of a success story can be seen uh, in Estonia, where the National Tax Administration has evolved from an old-fashioned bureaucracy to a future-looking service provider. Efficiency has increased fast with half the staff, reduced tax avoidance, and satisfied customers. And the citizens of Estonia are now regularly voting the Tax Administration among the best public service providers in the country. So really, success stories are possible in a rather short uh, time. And you really can uh, follow uh, in the countries which are not yet there, where this mistrust uh, 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 is, uh, is to be found. Um, so to those countries uh, which has uh, been able to achieve these uh, success uh, uh, stories. So, ladies and gentlemen, progress during the last 25 years has been enormous, and I have no doubt that the countries in the region will succeed. What is needed is, of course, hard uh, work, and really the re starting of this convergence uh, machine. Uh, Pro-competition structural policies to encourage innovation and dynamism, uh, and ultimately productivity, and also what is needed is the strengthening of uh, the institutions. And the OECD stands ready to work together with you to address these fundamental uh, challenges through contributing our experience and sharing best practices through our cross-cutting forums. So thank you very much for the attention. No, thank you. Thank you to you, both of you. I think really the excellent presentation, I think it really introduces very well the, the topic. It complements also. There were some 
repetition sometimes, I think they were quite useful actually, uh, which sometimes happens, I mean, and uh, you complement. If I, if I may very quickly, uh, I, Marie, I liked your clustering comments because you also remind us about, I would just uh, quote, uh, sort of uh, forgotten countries, you know, countries we don't speak much, because you mentioned also conflict, countries in conflicts, which I think is important to remember. The commodity producing countries, I think it's also good to remember uh, they're a bit more on the east side, but still, I mean, uh, that's an important uh, comment. The, I, I thought, compared to Sergei, uh, you had this uh, convergence illusion, I would call it, you know, the expectation gap, you know, thing, because before, before the, the global financial crisis, there was the expectation that the future growth rate would continue, of course, and uh, part of that was based on capital misallocation, you know, because sometimes excessive capital inflows in some sectors, and, uh, and then you get, of course, a correction. This is not something that is typical to, this, to that region. We also had that in the, let's say, in the older member states of the Union. Uh, but that's something that, that, that you, you, you mentioned very much. And then you, you get the, these questions when the crisis is badly managed, which is uh, very often the case. Then you get hysteresis effects, and then it, it feeds on itself. Then you get into a sort of pessimistic uh, sort of loop. And uh, so, I mean, that, that factor, I think it's important when you look at what is structural, really, and what are the things which are more related to the crisis and, and pre-crisis, actually, also. So, uh, so the, that, that, of course, is typically in the, in the topic on sustainability, of course, and uh, saying that the old model was, was good and then you had the crisis and then, no, the things, the crisis is also related to uh, sort of illusions about the uh, sustainability of the model which was before, which is one of the things you, you, you singled out. Uh, on the scope of reforms, I think what's quite quite interesting. Also, you came, of course, with of course, <laughs> uh, with some very important issues about the labour market, uh, which I think is probably something uh, which didn't come that much. And the, the huge migration flows that we have seen in the region, immigration, you know, a little bit on all directions. I heard a figure of, of 20 million people uh, moving ex for, across countries. I mean, this is huge. I mean, when you look at the population there. You mentioned uh, also the female participation, which I think is, is also very relevant uh, in uh, what happens in the labor market. Uh, but I think the migration flows didn't really come up. I know and there are so many topics, of course. The diffusion uh, of, um, of growth you know, between the, the top performing and the others, I think it's quite important to put the term inclusive there. But that's a little bit original, you know, because we know these gaps. But at the end of the day, it leads to income distribution <laughs> Uh, differences, of course, over time, uh, which, of course, creates reactions against, you know, uh, the top performing firms because the excluded, you know, will, will not like it, of course. And so, so I think to put diffusion um, from high growth to the others, I think, was, was also. And then the trust in institutions, of course, it's, uh, it's a quite delicate topic because <clears throat> we see that in the trust in European institutions has been eroding, is picking up again. Uh, recently, but that's a, quite a difficult topic because very often what you see in the population is uh, is sometimes the lack of courage or leadership. Sometimes, you know. So, but these are very difficult topics to address. But uh, you are perfectly right, I think, to to single out, you know, this trust in it. I would have been curious having other countries on your table, not only these countries, but other countries, because we also saw this erosion of trust in institution. Now, on the panel, we are really almost on time. A few, very few minutes. We are really on time. I will follow the program. So, Erki, uh, you have the floor. No, we have about seven minutes, but let's say we have a little bit of flexibility. <coughs> Thank you very much, Peter. I, I like very much Sergei's and Mari's presentation. Sergei said that EU membership matters. Mari and Sergei spoke about role of institutions. I want to come back a little bit to the roots of enlargements because it's sometimes we lose the sense of history. The first po post Cold War enlargement took place in, uh, in 1994 when Finland, Sweden and, and Austria concluded negotiations. Norway did also, but they failed in referendum. They be became members in 1995. I happened to be in the team who negotiated. In the middle of these negotiations, in summer 1993, Danish presidency organized summit in Copenhagen. That was after, after the end of the Cold War, and countries wanted to give the vision to the new countries from Central and Eastern Europe. And that meeting, basic cornerstones for enlargement were set up. And the summit said that we want to give an opportunity for those countries who desire, but there are three pillars which must be uh, completed. First, 
the candidate country has achieved stability of institutions guaranteeing the rule of law, human rights, and respect for and protection of minorities. Still important. Second was existence of functioning market economy, as well as the capacity to cope with competitive pressure and market forces within the Union. Third, the ability to take on the obligations of membership, including adherence to the aims of political, economic, and monetary union. Very far-sighted pillars in 1993. After that, in Essen, pre-access and strategy was agreed upon, and as Sergei said, that turned out to be very successful. It gave a solid, gave a solid anchor to all those countries who wanted to follow. In summer 1997, all the countries had applied. The European Commission gave an opinion on each country. They are, by the way, impressive papers. I went through a few of them, 100 pages for each. And then they said, what are the preconditions for negotiations? First chapter analyzed the political criteria under the title of democracy and rule of law. Essential parts were judiciary, its structure, and its functioning. It's no surprise that these issues remain a cornerstone in the European Union. When joining the EU, the countries took the commitment to respect these principles. And it's also very important that the European Commission actively monitors the developments closely and takes also actions after that whenever needed. This political side, which remains intact, as to the economic side, it's true that post-crisis economic development has been weaker. So it has been everywhere in Europe. We must also remember that. We had this second, second recession. But when you look at this in totality, let's see what happens. During the last 25 years, real per capita gross domestic product in Hungary and Czech Republic increased by approximately 80%, 8 zero. Very rapid increase, even in global terms. Some countries did even better. Estonia and Poland, corresponding increase in economic welfare was approximately 170%. And research from EBRD shows that the countries that joined the EU have also been better in ensuring that the growth is inclusive. That's also important to note. Rapid economic growth in the region, integration with the older EU countries, and convergence towards them has been an economic success story for the whole continent, not only for the new countries, but also for the whole continent. Show exa showcase example of economic reforms yielding benefits that can be and are shared widely. And now, since 2004, many of these countries are uh, integral parts of EU-wide production networks. I was happy to be a member of the Commission when the new countries arrived, the 1st of, uh, 1st of a uh, May in 2004. It was a great moment of unification of Europe. Two months later, I moved here, so that was a short-lived short experience, but never, I never forget it. But when we still celebrate those achievements, take into account the difficulties today, we still need to remember and come back to these prerequisites. <laughs> Global economy is full of sad examples of countries failing to catch up, failing to improve welfare of their citizens. And often they have, they have one common denominator. When the institutions are not stable and credible, if the rule of law is not respected, it's not possible to attract investments on the long, in the long term, and not possible to ensure sustainable economic convergence in the longer term. So Sergei is right that investments are the most important, but without institutions you don't have them. So they go hand in hand. As was said earlier, in pre-accession phase, EU was the anchor. It was followed, it helped. Later, it has been a little weak, as we have told. But it's equally important. The same EU uh, legal order applies to everybody. While this model of independent institutions and rule of law has been successful, Many see it challenged today globally, and also the problem is not unknown in our continent. Every country and every nation has the right to choose their political leaders and their political tendencies. But the membership of, in the European Union, which is based on common values and the respect of rule of law, brings also its obligations. The question is how to preserve the rule of law how to preserve independence of public institutions, including central banks and financial supervisors, from undue political influence. 
If you go to economic literature, you find a lot of evidence. It's not mixed. How important the role of institutions is. It's critical for sustainable growth, and there's more and more research which come to that direction. The countries that are able to share increasing prosperity and, for example, ensure education opportunities are better place to uphold functioning institutions in the long run. But of course, even the countries with good economic performance are not immune to temptations of various degrees of populism. But I, I will divide this populism in three tendencies. First is one type, that, that the establishment, establishment and the force in power is challenged. This is a challenge everyone in power must accept. It can also be a healthy warning if you have a, re a right remedy afterwards. It's not easy. But still, it's more serious if this populism take first a tendency where pluralist democracies and independent institutions are challenged. Even worse, if the rule of law and independent judiciary is challenged, then you go to the fundamentals of, of, the, of the principles of the European Union. The situation can become very serious. So, when the resilience of rule of law and independent institutions are, are challenged, it's important that we take the challenge and we, we, we are serious in our monitoring. Because we know that in the long run, such tensions within societies, especially if they persist, can be also detrimental to economic growth and development. Moreover, damage to the cohesiveness of a society may be hard to repair after such periods. Thank you. Thank you also, uh, Erki. Um, go to, to the next panelist, Dimitar. Thank you also, Erki, for your, your passionate tone. I think mm -hmm. this historical perspective. Thank you. A lot have been said by the previous speakers, so I can just add a few more points uh, and I will try not to repeat with the previous uh, presenters. But the topic is such that uh, we all uh, use more or less the same sources and uh, we cover the same uh, issues. Uh, well, if we look at the history, there were several examples uh, of uh, catching up, uh, and they were very successful, like the cases uh, of uh, Japan, case uh, of Taiwan, uh, Korea, Spain. However, all of, the, all of them, uh, uh, to all of them, it took a uh, quite long uh, period, uh, close to three dec decades uh, to catch up with uh, advanced uh, economies. And now we have uh, the, 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 the case of uh, CC uh, C, uh, C, C countries. So if you look at the, these historical examples, we can see that there are several common uh, features of this convergence process. Initially, there are very strong uh, reforms, and this creates a fast growth. Then investment to output ratio is increasing uh, at the initial stage, and this uh, leads to very strong and sustained growth in TFP. Also, the whole process is supported by uh, financial deepening. If you look at uh, our group of countries, uh, more or less the same features uh, appear. So, uh, the, the main difference might be at the initial stage when there was a huge decline due to the transition, due to the very specific circumstances. Afterwards, uh, strong reforms. Uh, low-hanging fruits were picked very easily and there was very strong uh, recovery of the output. And this was uh, driven mostly by uh, TFP, which was stronger than in this uh, historical set uh, of uh, catching up countries. However, compared with them, there was a slower uh, uh, performance in labor force growth and uh, capital uh, deepening. However, the Convergence process was caught uh, by the emergen emergency of the global financial crisis. And uh, if we look uh, what uh, we achieved in this period, we can see that uh, the uh, environment, uh, especially after 2000, was extremely favorable. The global environment, also driven by EU uh, prospects, uh, and much was talked by previous speakers regarding it. Uh, 60% of the catching up uh, in the post-transition uh, was uh, uh, achieved in the period 
financial crisis from 2008 put the whole process uh, on halt. Uh, however, after the crisis, there was some recovery. The cycle became uh, positive again. However, we can notice uh, on the upper chart that uh, the growth rates uh, were much more moderate than in the previous uh, two decades. And most of the countries are already above uh, the 2008 level. If we compare uh, with this uh, uh, historical set of uh, uh, convergence countries, uh, in our region, advantages were that we enjoyed very favorable environment, global environment, that is very rarely, maybe <coughs> once in 50 years, if not even more, with uh, global liquidity glut, low interest rates, rapid expansion of global supply chains, trade, uh, financial flows were uh, like never before, and EU prospects, EU uh, integration process. But on disadvantage side, uh, we can uh, notice uh, capital stock, which was obsolete, uh, low saving rates, aging population. When the countries uh, entered into the convergence, they, were, they already had uh, aging population. And in some of the countries, especially Southeastern Europe, uh, political uh, instability, wars, changing borders, and all this made the whole process uh, uh, more difficult. Uh, what were the main uh, impact? If we look, uh, what, what were the main uh, factors behind the, the uh, convergence? If we look, uh, we will find TFP, and it was said also before, I will not uh, repeat. Uh, productivity was growing because of new technologies, uh, new uh, 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 production, new capacities, uh, FDIs that entered into the region. And uh, most of the countries uh, improved, the, uh, reduced the uh, productivity gap with Germany compared with 1980, except uh, with Southeastern Europe, which is still below the uh, gap that it had uh, with product in productivity with uh, Germany. Well, TFP was the major uh, factor, and we saw in uh, Sergei's presentation. Uh, this came on the wings of uh, reforms. So EBRD transition scores is very clear. Uh, however, we can notice <coughs> that uh, in the first decade uh, of the convergence, uh, the achievement was much better. After that, there was some moderation. And we can argue that there are several factors behind. One might be that there was some natural stagnation. In some areas, uh, convergence was already achieved, so there was not much more to uh, uh, go uh, up. However, we see that in some uh, sectors, convergence was not achieved, and still it uh, st stagnates. Uh, EU driver as uh, a factor might be one uh, reason. Uh, once the countries entered the EU, those who entered, uh, it's not incentive anymore, and we saw that uh, reforms are stagnating. Uh, and if you look uh, in the regions, in the, uh, in the sub-regions in this region, we can see that uh, Southeastern Europe is uh, especially weak, especially in governance and competition. But also governance and competition are sectors where uh, other uh, regions, Central Europe and Baltics, are not uh, doing quite well or not doing uh, as good as in other uh, sectors. If, uh, 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 if we uh, divide this uh, whole process, in, uh, whole, whole uh, period in two sub-periods, we can see very strong convergence in 2000, 2008, and then slowing down substantial slowing down in 2016-2008. Only Poland is doing better in this second period than in the first period. All the others are doing substantially uh, uh, weaker. And uh, we have even countries uh, which are reversing in this process of uh, convergence after the global financial crisis. Well, where are we standing now? Uh, Again, if we make uh, three sub-periods, we can see that uh, all factors of production are slowing down. Labor, capital, but the situation is very concerning in TFP. It's uh, turning uh, even into negative 
territory. And uh, TFP is the key, as we also saw by the previous uh, uh, presenters, key for the future uh, convergence process. Uh, why? Because in labor, we are not so strong. In labor, there are some uh, uh, weaknesses, aging population, migration, they're all contributing to decline in the working age population. But there are some reserves, and we should look at uh, female participation rate and uh, un youth unemployment, especially in Southeastern Europe and to some extent in Central Europe. There is some reserve here to uh, go to these uh, resources and uh, to make labor more contributing to the uh, 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 economic growth. Uh, capital, capital gap uh, to EU is substantial, to US even more substantial, and uh, here we have to cope with low <coughs> saving uh, rates. So as I said, uh, the key is uh, uh, TFP, so reforms, structural reforms. If you look at the heat map, we can see that uh, where, where we should concentrate. For Baltic states, they're good in all these areas. Central and Eastern Europe institutions and business environment are areas where some action is needed. Uh, uh, Southeastern Europe, there are mar uh, much more work, institutions, uh, human capital, uh, innovation. But it's interesting to see that in business environment, Southeastern Europe is doing quite well, even better than Central Europe. And this might be for Central Europe some uh, uh, area where they can achieve uh, some stronger uh, uh, contribution to TFP. Euro area membership, I will not uh, talk much because everything was said before. So how do real and nominal convergence interact? Uh, obviously, the real convergence impacted also the nominal convergence, and uh, this is uh, natural. Uh, what is important that uh, nominal convergence uh, is uh, catching up with uh, real convergence, and uh, it's okay. But if you look at sub-regions, we can see that uh, uh, Southeastern Europe is not uh, quite good in this area because nominal convergence is uh, higher than real convergence. But if you look more in details, we can see that uh, in three countries there is some, uh, pr uh, pr uh, so some problem. Price pressures are not supported with uh, equivalent uh, growth. There is also positive shift in this area after the crisis, if before the crisis real and nominal were going uh, in the same direction. Now we can see that growth is uh, improving, although more moderately, but uh, there is no uh, creating of price pressures or there is less vulnerability. And to conclude, uh, obviously, uh, tremendous improvement was done in the real convergence process in the last 25 years, last uh, uh, part of a uh, large part of it uh, it was uh, created uh, before the global financial crisis after that the, we have slowing down and uh, the main challenge is how to foster the convergence process again thank you very much thank you very much dimitar we go directly to gasford now thank you It's a pleasure to be here and to speak on a topic which has always been very close to my heart. Um, for a long time, um, economists didn't take into account the quality of institutions. This has changed. Also, the ECB has done some work on quality of institutions also in Western Europe because we have experienced during the crisis that we have some issues also there. So, Klaus Masu has written a working paper already two years ago also the Austrian Central Bank is doing work on, on this and they ha have supported my preparations. Despite what Sergei has said, what we still do not understand too well, I think, is the interaction between the political um, system and the economic prosperity. Because we see countries with backlashes in democracy and still doing rather well economically, at least in the short term. And compared to Sergei's and Mari's uh, 
remarks, um, whose job is to point to gaps, I think, in the, in the institutions, of course, I would like to strike a, a bit more positive tone. I have talked to a number of entrepreneurs who are doing business in the region, and I'm meeting people from uh, Central and Eastern Europe in my daily work. And I think we have to keep in mind uh, where we come from. Um, democracy has a short history in our part of Europe, 100 years only, much shorter than the UK or Sweden, for instance. And during this century, many countries had authoritarian regimes for several decades and an exclusion from the transformation of Western Europe after World War II. And the last 25 years can be considered a um, window of opportunity favorable uh, geopolitical constellation, the EU still in the making, and the need for transforming the system. And when a visitor to the border region of Austria and Hungary asked me recently why Hungary still has only 53% of Austria's income per capita, my answer was rather vague because 25 years ago we had no clear picture how fast the convergence would be, nor what the ultimate success factors were. But we can say today, overall, a big economic experiment has worked. I would like to, to mention a few of the successes of the convergence process, uh, the outlook for the future catching up, some problems which need to be addressed, they go uh, in the direction of what the previous speakers have said, and special uh, opportunities which have to be focused on. This is the picture of convergence of GDP per capita. And what was done during this process? I mean, we should not underestimate the big difficulties of macro stabilization at the beginning of the transformation. Exchange rates, interest rates, inflation rates were a big challenge at that time. Uh, and of course also the stabilization of the financial sector. We had huge banking crisis in several countries which use losses of GDP. What has been achieved is confidence for investors, favorable terms for investors like tax exemptions. And this is the uh, FDE by economic sector. We see that we had capital inflows to industry, to services uh, at the same time, but we should not overlook that at the moment we have FDI inflows very much based on structural and cohesion funds. So this investment gap, which was mentioned already by the previous uh, speakers, is a very important point. Integration into global value chains was certainly a driver for growth and can explain the success of Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, as well as Hungary and Slovenia. So these are the global value change and, and, and the comparative advantages. Of course, uh, geography plays a role as well. Proximity to industrial clusters abroad and availability of trained workers and manufacturing skills. So there are old traditions in technical colleges, uh, technical knowledge, I think this is very important, and you see here uh, the increase in, in skills which we have seen over the last years. Of course, there are still gaps, but I think it's, it's moving forward. Change of control in the private sector was important, and institution building, of course. Um, we, we see here some improvements in governments, but still a lot to be done. The crisis has changed the picture, but only temporarily, I think. Uh, growth has picked up again, is picking up again. Now the, um, let's say, the, the pace of growth is one and one and a half percent above EU rates. Uh, also, EU rates are lower, but um, growth becomes more broad-based uh, now uh, in, in the region, domestic consumption uh, is a major uh, driver, especially, for instance, in Romania. The horizon for convergence has shifted into the future since neither excessive credit growth nor labor cost increases above productivity growth lead to sustainable uh, convergence. Therefore, this is the outlook, and if, if the growth potential would continue at the pace we see now, 
we would have a full convergence in, in around 30, 30 years from now. Of course, increased macroeconomic stability, a generally more balanced economic development uh, could increase the probability of an earlier closing of this income gap and focus on, on some factors which I, I will mention. Uh, this is basically the issue not only of institutional reform but also of, of innovation. Country bus differ. Uh, Control of corruption is an issue, continues to be an issue, uh, very difficult to tackle, but I think should be much more focused on. Government, government effectiveness was also mentioned by the previous speakers. I think quality of uh, public institutions, but also infrastructure. We see a huge variation in the availability of infrastructure and focused programs on let's say, combining different programs uh, of um, structural investments and infrastructures uh, would be important because we have, at the moment, we have many diversified programs, uh, not, not necessarily um, linked together. I mean, the fact that we need Chinese investors to complete a railroad system between two of our member countries, I think is a... Um, um, could, could be solved differently as well. There's an issue which uh, was mentioned by the IMF recently. This is the strength of public investment management by institution. You, you see here also clear divergences between countries. Uh, we tend to perceive the region with a common approach, but there are fewer commonalities than, than we think. Labor migration is still an issue. We see in some countries um, quite a large number of young qualified people who want to leave the country. Uh, we have, for instance, had a decrease in, uh, in population of 2% in, in Serbia recently. The incorporation of the acquis commentaire uh, as well as EU membership was mentioned already. I think it was a, a catalyst for change uh, welcome lever for standard setting one word on currencies, maybe. When the cooperation with the uh, new member countries was intensified, the message was nominal convergence is a precondition, but real convergence is required to make a common currency a sustainable advantage. And while Slovakia might be a role model on the one side, on the other side, Greece had the same rules but structural and institutional weaknesses and loss of cost competitiveness led to a painful reversal, of course. Countries like Poland and Czech Republic have demonstrated in the past that quality of institutions and an anchor currency as orientation can work if and only if the financial sector is under tight control. And the fact that Poland came through the crisis much better than other countries um, could have to do with macroprudential tools they have introduced already in 205, but also with counter-cyclical policy, fiscal policies, swap agreements, and the Vienna Initiative. But uh, we should keep in mind that there is a ratified treaty also on the currency adoption with clear rules on the adoption of the euro. Um, one more aspect of European policies, this is now more the opportunities for the future. If we look at the uh, European Innovation Scoreboard and the infrastructure gaps, there is a lot to do. We see here the R&D spending in the public sector, and we have policy areas like energy, transport, communication, and innovation. They will be the crucial drivers for growth in the future and, and for further catching up. We have here R&D spending in the private sector, and this goes very much along what Sergei and Maria have said. I think we need uh, innovative firms, we need firms which are more uh, linked to the research and uh, innovation institutions. We have, um, let's say, pockets of high technology uh, exports in the regions. We have very very successful companies, but we have still uh, a quite a, a gap between uh, Eastern and Western 
uh, parts of, of some countries. One issue which is very drastic, I find, is energy efficiency. If you look at that, you see there's a huge potential for investment for gains in, in let's say, productivity, but also in quality of life, of course. And let me conclude. The uh, economic and political transformation uh, in the region was a disruptive process. There have been great achievements, but there are risks ahead of us. There's more to be done and the risks maybe could be more in the political sphere than in the economy. Thank you. Thank you, Gertrude. Bosnian, I'm curious what you can add to all what has been said <laughs> up to yeah. now. Uh, not much, I think, uh, but uh, I, I really uh, like the, 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 the presentations of uh, uh, my predecessors, and I'm uh, because I'm the last, I, uh, I can I can summarize uh, what, what you all said, and then I, I think that I have some charts which which confirms uh, 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 what has been said already. Uh, but the the main point uh, that that I'll try to make is that uh, yes, we uh, we all observe the the economic convergence, but uh, uh, there is something uh, which uh, we and then all all my. Uh, uh, colleagues uh, who already presented their, 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 their views uh, also concluded was that uh, there is still some lack in institutional uh, institutional and particularly cultural uh, uh, view on, uh, on, on, on convergence. So uh, in, in general, uh, uh, to, to summarize everything, <laughs> what was said, that catching up uh, did take place. Uh, we see uh, the income convergence uh, 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 being fostered by, by EU membership. Uh, I, uh, I try to, and on some charts, uh, uh, distinguish or I try to, to single out the, the, the potential effects of the global financial crisis on, uh, on, uh, on different regions of, 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 uh, or, or different countries of, of our region. Uh, also touch upon the, the total factor of productivity, but I, uh, I, I conclude with, uh, with uh, still uh, uh, rather puzzling uh, uh, institutional convergence uh, in, in terms of uh, where we stand today. Uh, I still remember uh, the, the early days of the transition where uh, we were all uh, pretty much uh, following the, the Washington consensus uh, in, in those bold points starting with the uh, macroeconomic stabilization, uh, price liberalization, privatization. And then uh, the further down the list, uh, you, you came to a small print institutional uh, institutional uh, building and capacity building. And I think that this, uh, at least in my view, uh, has been uh, uh, overlooked in, in the whole uh, the whole process of, of, of convergence or, or transition in this respect. And uh, this is still something that uh, needs uh, uh, fuller attention. Uh, uh, from both sides, from the policy-making side and, uh, in particular, from from uh, uh, country side. So the uh, the charts uh, that I'll, I'll, I'm going to present only confirms the the the, the convergence. Uh, this is the, the charts on the sigma convergence, where I try to uh, split the, the region into those uh, who joined the EU a bit earlier and those who are still in uh, in uh, in uh, in a waiting room to become the, the, the members of the European Union in this respect. Uh, and we can see that uh, the, the sigma convergence in, uh, which measures the, the reduction of the dispersion of, of income among the, the, the group uh, uh, slowed down for, for, uh, for uh, uh, candidate countries or potential candidate countries while it, it continued for, uh, for uh, those who, who already uh, uh, became the member of the, the EU uh, a bit earlier. The EU membership uh, matters. Uh, I, I really like the, 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 the Sergei's chart on, uh, on this pickup of, of the ep efforts uh, uh, two years before uh, uh, entering the EU uh, in, in terms of, of the convergence and then building up of institutions. But we can see that uh, uh, there are uh, uh, differences among uh, those who, who who joined the EU earlier and those who are still uh, waiting to join the EU, particularly uh, after 2004, where where the the uh, potential candidate countries uh, convergence almost half in uh, uh, in uh, in measuring by by the the 
slope of the, the beta convergence. Uh, if, uh, if anything, and this was a, a, a bit surprising that, that we, we haven't touched upon uh, so far, is what was the effect of the financial crisis? And did uh, financial crisis uh, uh, affect the convergence uh, uh, in the region? In my view, uh, uh, the EU membership uh, um, did serve as an anchor for those uh, who were uh, um, able to join the EU a bit earlier uh, and uh, uh, impaired or uh, hampered the, 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 the convergent process for those who, who, who are still uh, waiting to, to become the, the, the membership member of the, the European Union. Um, these charts are, of course, very illustrative and, and uh, uh, not, uh, uh, not taking the full scope of, of the problem, but uh, it is something that, that might also work, uh, uh, work uh, as an argument that the EU membership does matter and does promote the, 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 the convergence in this respect. Uh, the, there, there, were, there were some, uh, uh, the, the, there was some mentioning of the total fo uh, factor productivity growth, but if uh, we split the phases of, of uh, what was happening uh, early in transition and then later when uh, some of us uh, uh, joined the EU, uh, we show that uh, the, 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 there is a heterogeneity among the, the different, uh, different countries in terms of uh, the total factor productivity effect on the, on the, on the growth. And uh, we have some unfortunate cases where uh, uh, total factor productivity even declined in this respect. The, the, there was, uh, uh, I think Sergey was, was, uh, was most elaborate on, on different factors uh, and then drivers behind these uh, uh, this, uh, processes, but it is something that, uh, that we need to, to keep in mind uh, uh, in, in further discussions. Now, uh, the progress, uh, has been remarkable in terms of, uh, of the human development uh, since uh, uh, early days of transition. Uh, and uh, the, the, the red bars uh, shows the, the improvement in the human development index. However, uh, we are still having problems with the institutional convergence. And uh, the, the right-hand uh, right uh, side uh, uh, chart shows that uh, once you enter the EU, the, the institutional convergence uh, uh, slows down. Uh, at least if you, if you look at the, the, the data only. Now, of course, there are, there are different explanations for this, but uh, my question uh, may be a little bit provocative question uh, for further discussion could be, uh, does EU membership uh, slow down the in, uh, institutional convergence once you are in? Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the right-hand chart, uh, strikingly, uh, uh, could lead to, to, to this conclusion that once you are in, you, uh, you put the handbrake and then just enjoy the, 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 the wave of, uh, of, of being in a group of, 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 of others. And then maybe this is also the question whether the institutions that we are jointly building in the European Union uh, are still continuing to, to improve the institutional quality. Uh, I, I would always say that uh, uh, institutions uh, are nothing but people who govern the institutions, and, and, and there is, uh, of course, uh, uh, still enormous uh, uh, cultural difference in, uh, among us in terms of how we perceive the institutions. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I can... Uh, I can speak for my own country, which, which was the front runner in, uh, in terms of the, the, the transition process, uh, convergence process. Uh, we were among the first to, to adopt the euro, but uh, being the front runner now uh, also uh, generates some uh, potential uh, backlashes. Uh, while, uh, um, why, why I'm saying this? Because we are uh, um, in, uh, in a rather unfortunate process of uh, undermining some institutions which uh, might be uh, important for uh, uh, further efforts uh, to uh, some institutional convergence in this respect. Uh, 
to 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 be even more bold, uh, we have uh, problems with uh, with uh, the, the central bank independence uh, in terms of uh, of uh, uh, responding to the financial crisis uh, which uh, we uh, we had to deal with, and there are, of course, in my view, uh, particular problems of perceptions on how institutions in in our countries, in our regions, are perceived by. Uh, uh, by, by general public, if not uh, the, the, the politicians. And in this respect, uh, I'd like to conclude and say, look, that we, we, we saw, we, we observed the, the economic convergence, but there is still uh, uh, enormous room to improve in terms of institutional, cultural uh, uh, convergence. And then, of course, there is a question whether the institutions of the European Union uh, uh, are there to, to, to continue uh, this, these efforts, uh, not only for, for countries in the region, but uh, for, for European Union itself. Thank you. No, th thank you, Bastian.